Hello, everyone, and huge thank you for joining us today for the discussion on how to manage toil as you scale. This is a lead dev webinar created in partnership with PagerDuty. The webinar will last roughly 45 minutes, after which both myself and the panelists will head over to the lead dev Slack to answer some of your questions in the scaling channel. We may also have some time to answer a couple of questions live, so please submit anything you want to know about in the Q&A feature on Zoom and we'll get to them if we have a chance. So let's get started with some introductions. My name is Molly Struby, and I am an SRE at Netflix. Today, I'll be joined by four amazing panelists, Alex, Delishni, Johnny, and Praise, who will be sharing their experiences and insight with us. If each of you could introduce yourselves, that would be fantastic. Alex, can you go first? Thanks, Molly. Uh, very happy to be here. My name is Alex Hidalgo. Um, I'm currently the Principal Reliability Advocate at Noble9, and I've been involved in the SRE space for over a decade. Uh, managing toil is one of my favorite topics and very excited about this chat today. Uh, also, please uh, disregard the uh, Patriot signage behind me. I'm not in my own office right now. That's right, trolling, but okay, cool. <laughs> Delicity, can you go? Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Delash Nitaisinga. I'm a senior engineering manager at PageDuty. Um, I currently manage the Rundic teams and the product line there. Um, I'm really interested in this topic because it does affect all my teams, um, especially one of the SRE teams that I manage. And I'm also really excited to learn from the others here on how they manage Toil as their company scale. Sounds good. Johnny. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Johnny Borsico. I currently uh, work as an uh, observability engineer at uh, Heroku, um, which is part of Salesforce, for those who don't know. Uh, I've been in ASRE space uh, in title or otherwise um, for quite a long time. Um, and uh, yeah, I've seen, I've seen uh, good things and bad things come out of uh, uh, SRE adoption, uh, including how to manage toil um, at both small organizations um, and very large ones, as you can imagine. So uh, yeah, I'm here to hopefully impart some of uh, what I've learned um, as best practices and some things to avoid at all costs. Awesome. And finally, Praise. Hi, everybody. My name is Praise Adorawa, and I've been an SRE engineer for about um, three, four years now. Um, managing toil is something I'm quite um, excited about because I've experienced this firsthand, as well as with a few of my colleagues, right? So this is something I look forward to sharing what I know about in this webinar, as well as learning from um, the rest of the panelists as well. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, so now that we know a little bit about all of our panelists, let's get to the meat of the discussion and talk about managing some toil. However, before we can talk about managing toil, we might first want to describe exactly what it is and define it. So, Alex, let's start with you. How would you define toil? So there's a few different uh, options we have there, I think, uh, but a good starting point is in the first Google SRE book, um, uh, Toil was pretty explicitly defined and it was defined there as automate, uh, anything is automatable, repeatable, tactical, um, you know, like I think I'm missing one, but you know, it's, it's, it's stuff that kind of distracts you from project work, right? That's the other way to kind of think about it is it's all the stuff you have to do that isn't overhead, which would be meetings, paperwork, right? Uh, and isn't your project work, isn't uh, directly uh, related to the longer term goals that your teams or your orgs have. Um, and so everything else kind of falls into this category of toil. Um, I also often like using the word interrupts because really most of what falls into this category interrupts you or interrupts your team. And this can be everything from someone on another team coming over to your desk or uh, pinging you on Slack to ask you a question. Uh, tickets being opened uh, all the way up to pages because um, a page is really just a high priority interrupt. Uh, it's not that different from someone asking you a question really in the sense that it pulls you out of what you're doing and causes you to switch contexts. Um, so, you know, toil is everything that kind of fits into that category, specifically stuff that you may be able to automate away. Yeah, that that definitely sounds good. Johnny, Delishni, uh, praise do any of you all have any thoughts? I can jump in with a with a with a quick story that it'll illustrate uh, and, and 
very tangible <laughs> um, sort of detail what what I what I see as toil. So the uh, um, um, years ago, in as sort of a small uh, organization, we we had a, a an offering where um, pretty much as we brought more customers on, we realized that uh, we needed to sort of uh, uh, restart some of our services um, on a regular basis, right? So this was after an incident where, you know, things should you know, grind to a halt. And, and, and during the, 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 the incident review, we were trying to figure out, okay, what happened? It's like, oh, this thing just kept climbing memory. Um, we don't yet have a solution for it, but we know that if we restart it, right, that buys us another, you know, three or four days, or whatever it is, until we restart again, based on the number of customers that are using it, you know, uh, basically based on what we know when it's triggered we know it's going to happen again in about three or four days and and basically we're like okay well when are we going to actually fix this problem uh we're like well uh, our priorities right now are very, are, are are such that we can't really make time right to go address this thing so this is what we're talking about now alex is saying this this is something that that is repetitive right uh it is manual right it doesn't really add much value but in a sense that if you don't restart that thing in, in about three days, when you start to approach the same, you know, sort of a characteristics that cause a failure at the same time, if somebody doesn't go in and sort of restart this thing manually, right, we're going to have another uh, incident on our hands, right? So it becomes this thing that we, we dragged on literally for like three or four months. We dragged on where we're like, eh, who's, who's, whose turn is it to go restart this thing now, right? So we, we did, but, you know, it, it was it automatable? Absolutely. Right. It, it would have it added value right to to the running of the operation. Absolutely. But there were other priorities. Right. Which made it like it, it became toil rather than being a, a bug that needed to be fixed or some operational um, issue that needed to be addressed. Right. It became toil. It transformed into toil where it now became part of the things that we did. When we, when we did sprint planning, it was like, OK, who's trying to restart this thing now when, when it blows up. Right. So that, that's why I see that. I feel like we've all been in those situations where you've got the manual restart job and you just have to make sure someone's on it every single day. Yep. So, you know, toil, you know, as we talk about it, it's a little bit a part of, of being an SRE. You know, we try to get rid of it and get rid of it as much as possible, but it's, it's kind of always there. Um, Delishni, how do you personally work around toil within a team? With my teams, we embrace it. It is hard to work around it. So one of the things we do is like we make sure that we track all of these. Um, the toil on interrupt, uh, sorry, interrupt, interruptions that we get, like unplanned work requests that we get. We make sure that we kind of track it, manage it, and prioritize it. Um, and most of my teams, we have a, uh, like a practice called an operational review where we talk through some of these things. Um, you know, we if we can tackle every single interruption that we get, and maybe the one interruption is that if we get something, it could be a really quick fix, but maybe we won't have time to think about, hey, what's the long-term fix? And the operational review is like a good place for our teams to you know, discuss, okay, what's the long-term strategy? Do we need to make a fix for this long-term or is this okay to do like the manual fix for now? Um, and as an engineering manager, a lot of my time is spent for making sure that my teams have that capacity in our uh, in our sprints, in our roadmap to address toil. Because if you put 100% of your team's capacity to product work, and then all of this unplanned work and toil comes in, it really, um, it makes it very stressful for everyone. So having like a percentage of your time set budgeted, set aside, that really helps. Um, and what Alex is saying about like interruptions, having most of my teams have an interrupt handler. So there's a designated person that will manage those conversations so that other people can focus on their product work. Um, yeah, and one other thing I would say is just for, we also try to budget for proactive maintenance. So sometimes, yes, you like have these conversations based on interruptions that happen during the week. But sometimes you say, okay, we've seen this a few times. We want to make this change, but it's a bigger change. We just don't have time to do it right now. But we have like maybe a month or two set for proactive maintenance and we can do it at that time. So the interrupt handler, I'm really curious about this. That sounds like a really handy tool to kind of shield people from, uh, from toil and interruptions. Can you maybe just talk a little bit more about how you implement that? And so in my teams, it, it was actually a, kind of an organic thing that happened at PagerDuty for all of the teams. We did have the on-call engineer for every single team, and they would handle you know, pages that we would get. 
But we noticed that they were also responsible for all the interruptions in our Slack channels, requests from other teams to review PRs or you know, uh, requests from support to help look into an issue. So what a lot of our teams decided is we were gonna have someone else who would be the interrupt handler and someone else who would be the on-call for the week. And the interrupt handler's responsibility is basically hand, uh, being the person that says, hey, I saw the request that you made on our Slack channel, we will look into it. Um, and they can always you know, get the support of their team if it's not something that they have you know, dealt with in the past. I love that idea, having kind of an on-call and then an interrupt handler. That, that sounds, you know, very practical and, and useful. So when it comes to managing toils, uh, what gotchas, I'll throw this at you, Johnny, what gotchas have you experienced when trying to manage it? Or maybe talk about like what fallacies exist in the industry um, around toil? Well, <laughs> I'll say this with, with a degree of certainty and that's because I've, I've seen time and time again how organizations try to treat it as, as, as a special kind of like duty, you know, as a special kind of, of work, right? Like it's, like it's not important, like it's not a high priority. Like it's like, a, um, it's almost like a second class of, of bugs, you know, you're like, okay, it's, 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 yeah, we have a bigger fish to fry. We have like features to develop. We have, we have big things to ship, you know, um, we, you know, we, impossible deadlines to meet as, as everybody does. Right. We start to treat it as a special kind of thing when we should rather be including it like we do with every other thing that we, as part of the software development life cycle, we should be including it in, in, in to every sprint that we plan. We should, we should be, basically say, okay, who's going to uh, address this particular uh, issue that's been a thorn, you know, uh, on our sides, you know, for the last, you know, two, three, four weeks, right? Basically, we need to integrate that as part of the work that we plan to do, right? And if we, and, and this, it's, it's, our fault as well, right? As as you know, technical leaders, when we go uh, to 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 the higher ups and we work with our manager, whoever that may be, to sort of uh, convey the importance of that work, we ourselves speak of it as if it, it is a second class of, of, of issue, right? Um, rather than saying, okay, well, in order for us to achieve you know these goals that we set, you know, for this quarter or this year, or whatnot, um, basically we're we're gonna need to you know uh, you know solve for this that and the other and one of these things is addressing the toil right so we can't separate it from the actual planning process we can't ignore it we can't just brush into the carpet and, and hope that it gets handled you know when somebody goes on call i mean it's so many times like you know we'll literally have uh, sort of a, um the shifts where somebody goes on call and because the work is 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 interrupt driven part of their task is also look at what, what's in the toil bucket and say, hey, what can I, what loading new fruit can I get from the toil bucket and, and try to, you know, quickly fix while I'm also on call, right? Because we associate, okay, toil, interrupt, and the, yeah, these make sense to sort of bunch together rather than saying, okay, well, during our sprint planning, right, when we do the engineering part of the job, we need to include this as part of the, 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 the plan for the work, right? That's the only time it gets addressed and gets the proper time, right? That it needs. Sometimes it there's, there's no low hanging fruit in the bucket anymore, right? Because you know if you're lucky, right? Every time somebody goes on call, they pick something and they address it, and it's quick, right? If you're on call for a week, well, maybe you get two or three things done, great. But sometimes it's an item that is basically fundamental to the health of your operation, right? It's part of your operational excellence goals, maybe, right? It, it's just, but it just so happens that we categorize as such. We need to sort of treat it more as okay, we need this for the business to, to be able to operate uh, successfully, for the operation of the services to be able to uh, operate successfully, right? So we you have to sort of change the lens at, with which we look at toil. Yeah, I, I love uh, everything Johnny says about like including this in your sprint planning. Uh, but I also love taking it one level above that, right? Um, on, on my teams, when I'm doing quarterly OKR planning, for example, right, I sit down with the team and we say, okay, how many weeks are we actually here, right? Uh, when are people taking vacations? And so we subtract those weeks from the total number of weeks we have available. And we subtract everyone's on-call shifts, right? We subtract that from the total available time we have while we determine what we want to focus on, you know, like in the, you know, like in the next quarter, um, you want to subtract that because you don't want to assume uh, anyone can get project work done while they're on an interrupt shift, while they're on an on-call shift, how, however you want to manage that. Right. Um, and I've, I've also found a lot of use in uh, being very explicit about 
you don't do project work while you're on one of these interrupt shifts, right? Because there's always something, right? When I first propose this to people like, no, you're just not doing project work. We're taking you out of the sprint, right? And you're just focused on this. And then, you know, the first objection I often hear is, you know, people are like, okay, but what if there aren't any pages? I'm like, well, then there's tickets. And they're like, well, what if there aren't any tickets? I'm like, there's always a dashboard to clean up, some monitoring to tune, documentation to update, documentation to delete. I've never, ever seen someone get to the point where they can actually say, we have zero toil left. There's absolutely nothing for me to do during one of these shifts. It's so true. I, I, I'm a big proponent of if you've got the pager, you should not have any other expectations besides handling that pager. And if you've got time, then yeah, clean up the toil, clean up those dashboards you know, tweak some of the alerts. Um, I think, I think that's highly valuable in it. And I think it also helps take the stress and expectations off folks who have the pager. Um, that, that should be their, their, their main goal. So we talked a little bit about handling toil. Praise, I'd love to hear from you. What factors do you consider when you're trying to decide like when it's time to handle that toil, when it's time to automate something? You know, we talk about like low hanging fruit and sometimes it's not low hanging. Um, okay, so yes, I think one thing we need to keep at the back of our mind is that automation always comes at a cost. And yes, so you have to be ready to pay for this. Now, I think the first thing that I feel is most important is the time aspect. Like everybody else has spoken about, you need to create time for this. But before you can even know how much time you need to create, I think first thing you need to measure how long do, do you spend like treating this toil as it is, not automating it right now. So how much time do you spend? Do you spend five minutes a day treating this? Do you spend um, 10 minutes a day treating this? Then when you have that metric, it is easier to say, okay, to automate this, how many hours would I need to automate it? Then you wait. Right. So when you say, OK, um, I do this task um, once every week and it takes me 10 minutes to do every week, then that means in a month I've only done this task for 40 minutes. But then if you wait against um, automating it and you see that to automate this, you need 10 hours, then you have to rethink. Right. But then some of these things don't take that long. So it's very important to weigh um, the time differences. Another thing you have to think of is the cost of implementation. Now, when you fix this toil, does it bring value to the business? What is the return on investment that you do? Because you, you're definitely um, giving out resources. Resources in this case could be human resources, could be tools, could be um, um, maybe some knowledge knowledge gap that you need to bridge, bridge to be able to fix this thing. So you have to take all of that into consideration as well. When I do this, what is the return on investment for the business. In this case, one thing we should also note is the frequency of occurrence. Is this something that happens once a year? Is this something that happens um, twice a month? If it's something that happens once a year and it takes, let's say for instance, you, want, you always migrate from one region to another once a year. Now you, you might think it's toil, but it is not in that sense because you do it once a year, it takes you, let's say 30 minutes to do this. If you want to automate it, by the next year, some of those factors you considered into automating it might have changed, which means you get to spend more time next year trying to fix what you've automated and then try to do the actual work. So you have to look at the frequency of occurrence as well, look at the resources you will need. And then, like I said earlier, the capacity, do you have the human resource to take care of this? It is easier when you're a team of um, five people where you know that, okay, if I take out one person to um, focus on the tour, that we have for a week maybe, then the remaining four people can get the work done effectively. It is very easy that way. But if you're understaffed in your team and you don't even have enough resources to get the actual work done, then it might not be feasible to say, okay, you know what, you're going to be on on-call and you're going to take care of everything we have in the toilet bucket. So you have to also look at the capacity, you know, look at the time you spend, frequency and a lot of other things, yes. Yeah, I definitely hear you. Automation can be, a, you know, a double-edged sword. When you automate something, then if it changes, then you've got to you know, update that automation. Um, anyone else? How, how do you all uh, kind of approach that that automation question? Do I handle this toil now, or do I push it down the road? I could add to it from what Praise is saying. Like those conversations are really important about doing that prioritization and like the cost benefit analysis of it and. 
um, what's something I emphasize with my teams is like, I don't expect the engineers to do it by themselves. Like we can have a team discussion and that's what the operational review is about. Um, and I, it's also a good avenue for them to get different perspectives from the team saying maybe this is the first time I've seen this uh, issue come up, but maybe other engineers have seen it before. Um, and then another thing I look at is if these interruptions are coming for us and it's affecting us, it's also affecting the team that's making that request. Let's say for an example, the support team has to look at um, certain logs that they don't have access to, but they have to interrupt our team to keep asking about it. It's you know, a trial for them. So then we look at it from a different lens and say, okay, why don't we, can we make this a self-serve option for them that they can get the logs that they need whenever there's a similar issue that pops up. So it helps both teams and not just us. I love that looking at it from kind of different lenses. It's not just toil for the SRE team. A lot of times it's if you can kind of solve it for the SRE team, you're also gonna be solving that toil on, on other teams. So there's, there's yeah, before we, before we move on Molly, if that's okay. Go for, yeah, go for it. Um, the, between what Prey said and 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 what I've just heard, like I'm I'm trying to there's there's a there's a story that just keeps popping in the back of my head where where we 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 had a situation where we did do this cost benefit analysis and 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 every time during ops review, um, the the sort of the the issues that not addressing you know this particular uh, um, piece of work. Uh, the, the side effect of not addressing it kept coming up during off Every week you'd be like, oh, well, you know, during discussion, we're like prioritizing things or whatever it is. This is what happened. You know, this is how we're handling it, whatever it is. And then that thing just kept popping up and it kept basically get, kept getting punted down the road, right? Um, because, you know, it was like, you know, the, that cost benefit analysis had been done. Uh, but just because you do a cost benefit analysis and you're like, oh, well, it's not worth it right now vis-a-vis -vis everything else we have going on, it's not worth it right now to address this, right? Uh, let's take it down the road. But if that keeps coming up, right, in every ops review, right, that means that whatever lens we use to measure our cost benefit analysis, right, maybe we need to recalibrate because if that thing keeps coming up again, right, it's not going away, right? And, and problems are left, you know, alone tend to sort of grow, right, and become more problematic, right? Um, the, that, that means you have a sort of a, a fundamental issue there. But my point is, that it wasn't the, uh, what makes this story special is because one engineer basically kept seeing that problem come up and up again, knew that we had done a cost benefit analysis and knew that we had kicked that can down the road. And, but they got so frustrated, right? With this particular issue, right? Every time they went on call, it showed up. Every time their colleagues went on call, it showed up, right? They took it upon themselves, right? On a weekend, right? To actually do the work. Now, I usually tell folks that don't don't be a hero, you know, a colleague, right? Don't you, you're setting a bad precedent, you know. You, now, now you want everybody, you know. Now everybody's gonna expect everybody to just pull, you know, feats of of engineering, you know, use up their weekends to go do stuff. But the thing is, it became such a problem, right? That that engineer took up on themselves to actually fix it, and they did fix it. But I think while that may have solved that problem, it introduced other issues, it uncovered sort of a, an engineering culture problem, right? Uh, perhaps it's one way you, look, could look, you could look at it, right? Like to basically as leaders within the organization, we need to actually see these things that just not, not, not just, okay, what's the time it takes to actually fix this problem, you know, to get it up, you know, what's the cost benefit analysis, but what is the cognitive load that we ask our engineers, our people, right, to carry, right? So, Yes, I mean, the cost benefit analysis, you know, from a dollars and cents perspective may not be there to justify it. But if, if I have an engineer use up their weekend to solve this problem, that's a different kind of cost, right? So I think we have to be sort of more holistic about how we look at, you know, basically, the, you know, when we look at the cost benefit analysis, we have to factor in that human cost as well. I think that is a brilliant call out because it, it's so easy, you know, especially as engineers, we kind of just get lost in the numbers sometimes and you forget that that human factor side of it. And if it's going to be frustrating, sure, it takes you maybe two seconds to do. But if that's going to just ruin your whole day, then, I mean, that's a big deal. Um, yeah, that's that's a really good call out. Any other thoughts? 
before we move on? Just that, you know, you also need to kind of building off of what Johnny was saying, you know, like you want to make sure that um, uh, uh, no matter what, to like reuse the phrase, you know, like cost benefit analysis, like no matter what that shows you, uh, you also got to make sure that um, you're addressing issues that you may have become numb to. I've seen this over and over and over again, you know, like in my career, where uh, people just get used to something. Uh, that may not actually have a big amount of context switch, uh, that may not actually have a huge human factor uh, um, um, load on people yet uh, is actually hiding a larger problem. Uh, like I think the most famous example I personally have of this is, you know, I used to work for uh, a large ad company and uh, we had logs on physical servers those logs represented ad impressions and therefore they actually represented money at the end of the day once they were processed and our servers ran out of room to hold a whole day of logs so it became the on-call engineer's job at 5 p.m every day uh they would get you know like an alert uh and we'd log in and run a distributed ssh command to go delete the logs that we knew had been processed right essentially doing human log rotation and we said, okay, you know, like, yeah, like we'll automate this. Like it's log rotation. Yeah. Like we'll automate it. Months and months went by and everyone just got used to every day at 5 PM, you log into the server and you go delete the logs that have been processed already, except sometimes um, time changes, right? We have daylight saving time. And so I logged in once and I forgot that the time had changed and the time in our servers hadn't changed. So I deleted an hour of logs that hadn't actually been processed yet which represented, uh, I believe, six figures worth of revenue that just kind of, you know, like disappeared, you know? And it, immediately after that, of course, we went and automated this and we got proper log rotation set up and it took someone, you know, like maybe an hour to get this set up and, you know, uh, um, uh, deployed across the fleet and, and all that. But, you know, we just become so numb to this and it became part of our daily routines. And it actually wasn't too much of, of a context switch, right? It was just run this one command. We all know what the command is. Um, but, you know, then one day I put the wrong number in, in terms of the hour, and uh, suddenly it became a much bigger deal. <laughs> uh, imagine, okay. imagine you're onboarding a new team member. Now having to explain, right? Mm -hmm. You have to log on every day. You know, you know, type in this thing, like run this script, and they're like looking at you like, why haven't you uh, automated this? And, uh, and now I'm trying to explain like your, your cost benefit analysis. Like they're like that, you're weird, right? Like what, what did I just join here? Right? What kind of YOLO <laughs> you got going on here? <laughs> it's, it's so true though. A lot of times it really, it takes, you know, you get stuck in that, like that the hamster wheel of doing it and it takes it takes a new hire. It takes someone to come in with fresh eyes and be like, what are y'all doing here? <laughs> and to, to kind of snap you out of it. Um, also, if I had a nickel every time, time just messed up things. Let me tell you. <laughs> I think it's not DNS, it's time. It's, if it's not DNS, it's time. Like, let's, let's be honest, you know, and we've got a time change. You know, PSA, there's a time change coming up this weekend. Okay. <laughs> just throw that out there. So everyone check your, check your code. Make sure it's all good to go. Anyways, well, let's keep, we'll keep moving on. So you all hail from many different companies that use different approaches for managing toil. Um, could each of you maybe share some of your favorite tools that you just to manage and kind of stay on top of toil? Uh, Praise, do you want to start? Um, yeah, so I think um, the most important thing here is to identify this toil you need to identify it. So um, like um, Alex said, sometimes you get numb to it that you don't even know that it's a toll. So first thing you need to identify it. Then like um, Dalishne said, you can track and then measure the store. Most importantly, you have to be able to log them so that um, everybody that goes there can see that, okay, this thing, you log it as a bug. So anybody can see that this thing needs to be addressed. So for that, you could use any, um, Login to you could use anyone um, by by extension when these tasks are logged then anybody on call you can have teammates on rotation to pick up these things like everybody has been speaking about um, since so you could use pages you could use any login to you could use um, by login to now I mean tracking to um, Jira whatever it is that you want to so, yeah awesome oh man Jira 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 Jira. <laughs> Delishnik, can you maybe talk about what tools you use? 
Uh, yeah, so we use Jira as well. That, that's pretty good for tracking. Um, we also use Rendec, which sounds like a plug, but we actually use Rendec within our teams to help automate the toil. Uh, Rendec basically automates anything. And like I was saying with the support scenario that I mentioned, um, we have a lot of, we want to have a lot of empathy for our support engineers who get a lot of requests from customers. And we try to make it as self-serve as possible for them to get the data that they want. So maybe it's uh, more account information. Maybe it's like some diagnostic information that they need before it gets escalated as a bug or um, a page. And then we also touched on the human aspect of Toil. Um, as a manager, the best tool for me is my one-on-one. You know, getting into the conversations about things that maybe are frustrating people that may not come up in all of our team meetings. Um, this is a tool I use based on Lara Hogan. She had this is a question that she, she suggested in terms of getting to know new engineers. It's what makes you grumpy. I occasionally sprinkle that into one-on-ones with folks that have been there for a while. So you will get the things that are in the back of their mind that is upsetting them that we haven't addressed yet. Um, and that's a good way to kind of gauge like, okay, we've seen this multiple times as a team, we haven't addressed it, it's frustrating them. Um, so that as a manager, I can get a better pulse check. I love that. I love that using those, those one-on-ones to kind of help you stay on top of it. Johnny, what tools do you like to use? So I'll, 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 not, I'll not emphasize the, any one tool. We, we use a number of different, we'll use Jira, we use Trello, you know, at Heroku and Salesforce, we have our own internal things. What I will say is that, and, and I'm gonna and I'm gonna reach into my, my bag of experiences and 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 tell you a story of what what, what has worked for me. Okay, um, the the tying this back to the 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 whole cost benefit analysis thing we were just talking about earlier. Uh, and and how, how do you tie that, right, with a tool, whatever tool you happen to be using, how do you make these things work for you, right? I had a particular problem, which was uh, um, deemed as toil, not by me, but it was, it, was, it was identified as toil. It went into, you know, the, we were using Kanban, it went into the, the, the to-do uh, uh, on board, and, and, and things kept, you know, piling up on top of it, you know, other, other tickets came in. Right. Uh, the, the nice feature about this board was that it showed you for on each card, right, how old the thing was. OK, now on day, I don't know, 29, right, a cost of benefit analysis was performed. OK, and this cost benefit, benefit analysis yielded the opinion that we didn't need to address this. Right. This is on day like 29 or something. Right. So we've been experiencing this for a while. And and uh, and I'm like, hmm. That thing's been sitting around for a while, right? What is the impact of this thing actually, right? Like, yeah, we, we decided it wasn't, you know, worth addressing. Um, and then what I did, what I started doing is, was that every time there was an issue, an oper operational issue caused by that thing that's been sitting there that we decided it wasn't worth it, right? I'd go into that ticket and I'd kept, you know, adding comments, right? This is uh, what was, uh, this was a problem that, that appeared and it was likely due to this particular thing. So I started tracking, right, a series of events and documenting the things that were piling up as a result of not addressing this thing that we decided wasn't worth addressing, right? Let me tell you, the next time a cost benefit analysis was done on that thing, it was clear. It was clear as day that this thing needed to be priority number, number one. We need to fix this because it is causing a chaos everywhere else and we just didn't know, right? So whatever tool you use, make sure it can tell you how old something is and, and for the love of God, track the impact, right? Of whatever that thing is, track it. That way, when you go to have a conversation with your manager or whoever it is, is, is deciding that this is not worth having right now, make sure they see, right? A trail, a documented trail of things that have been happening as a result of not addressing this particular ticket. Love that. Squeaky wheel gets the grease. Yeah. <laughs> Alex, how about you? What, what tools do you like to use? Well, surprising probably absolutely no one that's known me for more than about five minutes. Uh, I like I like using SLOs and error budgets. Um, you can set service level objectives on things that aren't just like the latency of your API endpoints, right? Set reasonable targets and goals for um, how much toil your team is supposed to be sustaining, how much you can handle. If you exceed that error budget you've set, maybe this is now an all hands on deck situation. Perhaps you 
cancel your current sprint because everyone needs to jump on things and and make things better. You know, set SLOs around th- these kind of more human factors you know, as well, and you know, use that data uh, as kind of Johnny was alluding to, right? You know, like you want data to justify things. And SLOs are great data you can use to go to whoever it needs to be, uh, leadership, uh, like your sprint planner, whatever it is, and say, look, I have this data, like this is a problem. Uh, uh, we've exceeded our error budget for our ticket load, our toil, our, right? Like whatever, uh, uh, how you want to measure it is entirely up to you. But you can then use that data and say, this is clear that we need to do something about this. Yeah, I mean, I think as as SREs, I think we can all agree data data kind of helps trumps all in a, in a sense. Um, so we've talked a lot about how oh, like all the kind of the downsides of toil um, and and how to manage it and make less of it. Alex, I'm wondering, what do you think is all toil bad? Is there any toil that can be beneficial? Yeah, I think a thing that people often overlook is they automatically because we've kind of as an industry chosen to use this word toil, uh, which, you know, has its own definition, just an English language definition. And and it's not very, it's not a very positive one. Um, But I found over the course of my long career, there's actually a lot of people who enjoy some of this kind of work. It can be a nice break from your project work. It can be a nice kind of change of scenery. Um, You know, I love actually, you know, maybe I'm a weirdo, uh, but I love seeing a big ticket queue (laughs) and being like, cool, this week, I'm going to reduce this by, 20% or something like that, right? It it can actually be fun. Like you can gamify it a bit. I wouldn't pit people against each other, of course, you know, Um, but you know, like it can, it can be a fun change of pace um, to address, you know, like some of those kind of issues. And um, I think often people go into it uh, uh, feeling like it's, it's, it's going to be a drag. Uh, People often go into it thinking that it's, 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 it's the worst part of their job. Um, And it just often turns out to not actually be the case. Sometimes you just need that mental break. Does anyone else have any thoughts kind of around ways you've seen toil, you know, kind of be beneficial? I would say it's also around um, the scaling part of, you know, our conversation. Sometimes when you, as your services scale, there are things that come in that we would classify as toil, but I see it as a positive thing. That's like, okay, there's more usage, we need to scale our services, mm-hmm. or it's been used in ways that we didn't expect. Um, that to me is a good indication of, okay, the things we built are useful. Now we just need to manage the next level of usage. Short term toil spikes are an excellent indicator of a growing business. Some problems are good problems to have. I think we can agree on that. <laughs> So we touched a little bit on it earlier when we talked about kind of automating toil. Um, Delishni, I'm wondering, could you talk about, you know, being a manager, I'm sure you have to have these conversations, you know, with stakeholders um, and other managers uh, about, you know, using investments to, to pay down and manage some of this toil. How do you approach those conversations? Um, what I would emphasize what Alex is saying before, like use data. Um, that's one where you can even start it off as simple as tagging things that come in as unplanned work and saying X amount of last month or X percentage of last month was spent on toil, unplanned work, whatever you want to define it as. Um, That's the like the simplest way to start to say, okay, 20% of my team is going to be allocated to that. And then I work really hard to make sure that the product managers that I work with, the people in leadership understand that our capacity is not going to be 100% allocated to product work. Um, And we leave budget for this unplanned work um, and making room in your roadmap, like what I said. Um, And then we have a good strategy as an organization on how we handle it. So it's not just, doesn't feel like you as a manager are responsible for figuring out how to tackle it for your team. That as an engineering org, we have a strategy around it. So at PagerDuty, we usually say like around 20 to 30% is allocated for unplanned work for a team that comes in. And it, it could also be called like, you know, keeping the lights on. Um, so that's definitely one way I've uh, managed it as a engineering manager for teams. Nice, nice. So we actually got a question from the Q&A. So I'm going to throw it out to you all. Feel free to jump in. So one attendee would like to know, 
how do you manage toil that is generated by other teams that don't want to fix the root problems? I'm like, fine, carry my pager. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. I think, you know, one, one thing I, I always think about um, when it comes to other teams is like, that's when you really need to pull out that empathy card and, and kind of like figure out how, how to speak to them, you know, in a way and maybe show them how, how it affects your day to day and, and what it kind of, how it affects, you know, what you do. Um, and you got paged at night, you know, make sure they know if, if that's, if you're getting woke up in the middle of the night for, you know, for, for issues. Um, and things like that. Anyone else have any thoughts on, you know, kind of managing toil that, that other team produce or how to talk to other teams? Praise? Yeah, um, I think they actually mentioned something around that where, you know, another team needs logs and then you have, they have to reach out to you at every point. So taking that as, as an example, I think it would help if, well, based on the um, intricacies of the kind of um, toil it is, uh, maybe if there is some sort of self-serve, like she said, you know, teach them how to do this thing so that they don't have to come to you. It might be their problem, but they are coming to you because you have a solution. So maybe one way could be, you know, letting them know how it impacts you, like you just said, Molly, and then, you know, showing them how it is done and then let them go ahead and figure it out to go about it. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the empathy approach is always, should always be the first approach. Um, you'll often find that people care about other people um, a lot more than you may even at first realize. Um, but I'll also say what's maybe the unpopular answer, which is, you know, you, you know, escalate it. Uh, if you need your manager or your manager's manager or the director that this other team reports to, if, if you have to get people involved, that's why we have these hierarchies, right? That's why we build teams with managers and managers of managers. It's to help resolve some of these issues. And, you know, absolutely go empathy first, but you can use the structures built within your, within your organization. Uh, sometimes you need to escalate. I'll add, I'll add one more piece of experiential learning. Um, the, we had, a, we had a big project. Uh, um, I'm not going to say where I'm keeping, you know, names and, and things, identifying information <laughs> out of the story. But we had a big project uh, um, that uh, my team, uh, which was actually designated as an SRE team, um, to basically help roll out um, a tool uh, that would uh, basically um, help uh, uh, pretty much every team within the organ engineering organization basically surface some some data, right? Make it easier to, to, to define our SLOs more clearly, make it easier to identify uh, bottlenecks and et cetera, et cetera. Um, um, the problem is whenever you have you work within an organization where you have silos, right, uh, different teams that basically have adopted their own set of toolings, their own set of best practices, or whatever the case may be, right? You know, again, they're they're doing the, the the best thing for them to be able to deliver their service and, and and the capability they're in charge for, right? So the the everybody develops their own their own things, right? So now when you when you come in, right, as 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 an SRE saying, well. Uh, the mandate from above is that we need to implement this thing. Now, teams are going to be like, well, we don't have this problem, right? Uh, whatever it is you're trying to do, you're trying to fix with everybody. Like, we don't have this particular problem, right? Now, imagine you have two or three or four or five, right? Saying, hey, like, yeah, if, if we take, you know, a huge chunk of our, you know, capacity, you know, to, to work on this thing, um, yeah, we may all benefit, but right now I've got fires to put up, right? Again, with Alex, you know, basically you know, pointing out that there's this level of empathy, right, that you need to have here. The thing is, if you're lucky enough to, to be within an organization where you can have uh, actual sort of a, um, uh, where you can embed SREs, right? That's 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 a that's a, a great mechanism to be able to sort of have somebody who is on site, right, with the, that team is learning, okay, where, where are the issues? What are the issues you're experiencing on day to day? What is called, what is preventing you from being able to sort of a, um, work as part of this greater program or project, right? To, to, to implement some things that are going to be new and that whereby you may not see the value for, to you directly in the short term, but in the long term, that is going to alleviate this burden that you are currently seeing, right? Unless you can have somebody sort of a, do this sort of a, a, a advocacy job, right? From within those teams, when you can have that happen, it's great, right? Like uh, I'm going to, 
shamelessly plug here, you know, I've talked about sort of with the SRE as a diplomat, right? Um, basically as a concept, right? Having forward deployed SREs um, sort of be in those different teams was well, basically to then those people coming together to say, well, this is what each one of my res respective teams are, are, are experiencing, right? Um, so basically those teams then see the, the embedded SREs as allies that, that you know, you're in the muck with us. You're seeing exactly the pain we're experiencing, right? We're going to open up to you, right? We're not going to put up a wall like somebody who's coming and say, hey, you need to implement this thing, right? You no, know, you're one of us, right? Um, so now when, when all the one of us is, right, get together and start exchanging information, this is how we can actually move this whole thing forward, right? If you're lucky enough to be an organization where you can actually do that, that I think that's the best, the best case scenario, right? If you don't have that, then yeah, you have to it basically, as Alex pointed out, you have to take sort of the more, I guess, draconian approach of basically saying, well, um, let's talk about the, the leaders, you know, the leadership and, and basically make, force it down but that all doesn't always work, right? You know, people don't, you know, no, regardless of where you are in the hierarchy, people don't really like feeling like they're being sort of a push to do something, right? They want to feel like they're part of the solution, not being not being forced or told to do something. Now they gotta, you know, now they have to, right? So. Yeah, I love that that SRA is a diplomat and everyone wants to be part of the we. We want, you know, we want to have that, that we team feeling as opposed to like them and us. Um, really, really great. Well, thank you all so much for all these amazing insights. Thank you everyone for joining us today um, for this, you know, how to manage toil sponsored by PagerDuty. We're all going to be heading over to the lead dev Slack in the scaling channel to continue this discussion. So feel free to join us there and hope to see you all next time.